now we'll move on. We kind of have a lightning round toward the end here of a few other topics we want to talk about. We'll talk briefly about triple negative breast cancer. I think the first thing I'd like to ask people, um, do you think there's going to be a role for subtyping triple negative breast cancer going forward? I mean, we kind of do it informally, but is there going to be a role for a formal subtyping, like to put people in trials for this particular type, say an AR positive subtype versus an immunomodulatory subtype? What do you think? Yeah. I think we're there. So we I do that now. We're there. We're doing now, at least in my institution and uh, uh, in uh, our consortium we're a part of. I mean, we are... Uh, selecting patients with triple negative breast cancer that are AR positive, androgen receptor positive by immunohistochemistry for allocation into trials with enzalutamide plus something else uh, versus enzalutam versus uh, cisplatin plus uh, something else. So, so I think that's happening. Would that, ha would, would that happen to other subtypes? Well, uh, we don't have any data yet, but I think eventually we may. So, and just going to the AR positive subtype for a minute, you know, I started getting into this because I have a patient who's undergoing a sex change and developed an ER positive, AR positive breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And so we started looking into this and, you know, you know, testosterone and AR in like non-triple negative breast cancer actually involutes the breast. So why are we doing inhibitors? Why are we not doing stimulators? That's a very important question. There is a concern by people that study these receptors <coughs> that uh, in tumors that are estrogen deprived, ER positive tumors that are uh, uh, on an aromatase inhibitor, and that are also AR positive, which are the majority of them, by right. the way, mm -hmm. the addition of enzalutamide may be deleterious. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think we need some more mechanistic science there in order to define uh, whether we should deploy an anti androgen just widely to any tumor that is AR positive. Right. Yeah, and I guess the data that we have to date on um, AR receptor inhibitors in triple negative breast cancer is really a phase two data, and we're not sure if it's more of a prognostic marker or a true therapeutic marker that these patients would have done well anyways if they have AR positive disease, or whether this is actually a true treatment evaluation. So we'll await the, the randomized data, but there's no doubt in our mind that you know we do need to start stratifying these patients. And, and the role of immunotherapy is probably, at the present time, seems to be the strongest. And, you know, it's relative terms uh, compared to other breast cancer subtypes. And at least the data that we have seen, that the mutational load, the type of uh, triple negative breast cancer that we're seeing is more likely the type that's going to respond to yeah. immunotherapies right. compared to some of the other bre uh, breast cancer. We'll get to, we'll get to immunotherapy in one second. I want to just, just finish with the AR. So, Joyce, you've done a lot of work with this. I and mean, what's your thought of where do you think this is going? you know, in the AR positive triple negative subtype? I think there's a small percentage of the AR positive triple negatives that are very strongly AR positive and more solely proliferative. And um, if you look, there's this new diagnostic um, predict AR that's uh, right. RT-PCR based, et cetera. It does look to be more predictive than just IHC, so that's helpful. But if you look at the correlation between the predict AR positive and the strongly AR positive, it's really skewed towards very strongly AR positive. So it does pick up some more weakly positive by the IHC. So that might be helpful for small, but there's a pretty good correlation. Um, I actually am impressed with the data uh, as, a, as a predictive marker. And, and there is definitely a prognostic thing there as well. But I think that um, in the enzalutamide phase two in this heavily pretreated group of patients getting up around 40 to 50 percent and the clinical benefit rate was pretty impressive in these, um, you know, predict AR positive. Um, but there's, then there's this other group that are more weakly AR positive. It won't be all about AR in those patients. And are these the PIK3CA mutant um, uh, triple negatives? You know, Carlos has some interesting data on that. I think that's an intriguing possibility. I think AR is very important. I think it's one of those targets both in triple negative and in HER2 positive, and even more complexly in uh, ER positive that we need to go after pretty vigorously because we are going to figure out how to, how to really utilize it. But I actually think that um, the phase three trial will start of enzalutamide in the first line metastatic setting. So we'll get phase three data, but um, it'll be a while. That's, it's not a very common patient population. I personally would like to see a trial fairly quickly in you know, strongly predict AR positive patients in the no path CR setting, for example. I'd like us to move a little faster in this regard. So before we get to immunotherapy, which is I think the topic A in this field right now that we all have a lot to say about, I just want to ask one quick question. Should we be using BRCA status and um, HRD status and or HRD status, homologous deficiency repair status, 
to determine who gets platinums? And so, get yeah, Should so we I be using we have, that or not? We have the TNT trial right. um, that was reported last year showing that patients who have BRCA-associated metastatic breast cancer receive, in this case, carboplatin uh, versus taxane. The carboplatin arm had a much stronger PFS uh, and a much higher response rate. So, uh, yes, so I think it does influence um, the treatment decision, yes, and BRCA status. Uh, BRCA-positive patients in the metastatic se setting should preferentially get platinums over taxane. The question in the adjuvant setting, should that make a difference, is uh, not as clear because the Germans uh, group did not show the additional DFS advantage in the new adjuvant platinum setting that they have seen in overall patient population in the BRCA-positive patient population. So that's kind of surprising. And I think it may well be that it's, um, that chemotherapy may be more effective in BRCA-positive triple negative patients with anthracyclines and taxanes. Yeah, I'm up in the air in my practice on this right now. I don't know yeah. about you guys. Do you use a chem? Um, for no positive, triple negative, I'm routinely incorporating a platinum in the new adjuvant setting. With, with or without BRCA? With or without. BRCA. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, no, we're, we, we are, uh, we but control. something we're doing actually is that we are, at my institution, we're now reflexing androgen receptor immunohistochemistry in patients with newly diagnosed triple negative. And we have had a couple of situations where, uh, uh, encumbered by those data, we decided not to do neoadjuvant chemo. Mm -hmm. There's an increasing number of papers. This is a patient that has a, sm had a relatively small tumor, so uh, neoadjuvant care therapy may not have been indicated on her. A couple of them, actually. And there are an increasing number of papers that show that these luminal AR positive, triple negative, they just don't care about chemo. Yeah. Okay. There are a number of observations. So, so I think, I know this is not a standard of care, but sometimes we, we you know, biology can tell us a little bit about uh, something we can do in, in unique situations. But you're still offering those LAR triple negative patients adjuvant chemo of or course. some yeah. chemo. Okay, of I just course. want to make certain. Of course. Of course. I just want to be clear because no. I, I don't think we have enough data. For that, no. no, I no. Agree. no in this case, in this case we thought that it was, uh, we were anticipating, we have a large trial we just completed where we uh, compare cisplatin, taxol, plus minus everolimus. There was no difference between both arms. Uh, overall, path CR was about 40%. Uh, and uh, it was very clear the AR positives, aluminal AR by RNDC just didn't respond. Mm, interesting. I just want to make a comment about the um, carboplatin, and we await, you know, the NSABP adjuvant with the AC followed by paclitaxel plus minus, to kind of add on to a standard. I um, had been using a lot of the uh, carbo initially based on the past CR rate, but I was uh, sobered a bit by um, Dr. Sykoff's three-year disease-free survival data and digging into the supplemental tables and seeing the actual number of events and such. Unfortunately, there's just not a hint, you know, on the backbone of a standard ACT that we're doing anything from a disease-free survival uh, perspective. Although, if somebody's got a BRCA, you know, then I, I do, right. um, you know, I do, I do really, I do really think, think very, very carefully about it. Yeah, I think GPAR-6 does long-term outcome on the backbone of a weekly taxane schedule, though. You know, I, I just don't think we have a definitive answer. No, no. no. At this point, but I think no. at least but they're both consistent to show that there is a higher PCR rate. Sure. To your point, you know, if you want to obtain local control and high disease burden, then it makes perfect sense to be able to inc incorporate the platinums. Whether it's going to translate into better disease-free survival for all these patients still is debatable. Right. Okay.